Hi. So today we're going to be talking about motivation theories, and there's quite a few of them to review today. So um, hang in there. And much like the other educational psychology theories that we've talked about throughout the semester, we're really going to be looking at motivation through several different perspectives today. So we'll look at how different um, different psychologists have really looked at motivation and how it might explain human behavior. So we'll talk about drive theory today, humanist theories of motivation, cognitive theories, and then um, next week we'll talk about applications. So drive theory, which is really coming out of the neo-behaviorists, neo um, so think social cognitive theory, also really think about behaviorism and what that means. <clears throat> so the first um, thing to review is what is intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And hopefully these are terms that you've heard before that um, are common to your experiences. Um, so in extrinsic motivation, um, remember, is the motivation to engage in an activity as a means to an end. So I might not love working um, working, but I do it to make money, right? So um, I'm extrinsically motivated to go to my job every morning because um, I get a paycheck at the end of the week, right? Um, for the reward, um, praise, um, cash, um, getting a piece of candy, whatever the reward is. Um, intrinsic motivation, on the other hand, is motivation to be involved in activity for its own sake. So um, I might be intrinsically motivated to um, read a book because I enjoy it. It has challenge. It gives me control. I have curiosity. It has aesthetic value. So um, and really, um, it, this might be a simplistic way of viewing motivation because um, for a lot of things, we have both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to be involved. Right. I go to work. Um, I love my job. I'm intrinsically motivated to teach. I get some reward out of it as far as um, a cash, right? I, I wouldn't do this if I didn't get paid. Sorry, guys. Um, but I also am intrinsically motivated to do my job. I enjoy what I do and I get reward. I get internal rewards out of it as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about behaviorism. Um, just so we remember um, that future behavior, according to the behaviorist, is determined by either an associated stimuli like Watson, um, thinking about, you know, the scared rabbits, um, or um, by reinforcement or punishment, Skinner, and that really relates to that extrinsic motivation, right? And thinking about how motivation is relevant here, that in strict behaviorism, we're really looking at that um, extrinsic motivation, right? That extrinsic rewards. Yeah, behaviorism, on the other hand, um, we're looking at Hull and Spence's drive theory research, um, which is really behavioral in nature. And their goals were to recover um, how and what rewards and punishments would result from a desired punishment or performance. So um, motivation are the manifestations of basic needs and drives so that we um we are motivated because of the drive, human basic drive. So we do things because of everything that we do. Every behavior we have is motivated by some sort of basic human need. And when we want to figure out why someone's doing something, what their motivation is, we can tie it back to or connect it back to some sort of basic human need that's fulfilling, which is a really interesting concept. And that's what drive theory is all about. So the first thing is we have some sort of need, a deficit or longing that people sense. Um, so we have a need. Um, so like I'm hungry, right? And then we have some sort of incentive of a thing. Um, and then we have a force. So incentive is, contains valence, which is the degree of attractiveness and the activity or the thing that is the behavior goal. So we can think about if I'm really hungry. Um, I could eat cookies or I could eat carrots. And both of those have a differing level of incentive to eat, right? That I might be more motivated, that cookie might be more appealing, but the carrot would also fill that need for the cookie monster, right? Um, and then there's a force, and that's a behavioral tendency. So I'm just going to eat, right? So the, the thing that we see is the eating or the goblin, right? Um, and they also claim that habits play a role. So that if I... 
um, got into the habit of eating carrots, and carrots were the thing that Cookie Monster was constantly getting, then then he would great get get more incentive from eating carrots. So that as we um, as we do one thing over and over again, that thing gets reinforced to fulfill that drive. It becomes um, it, it can it can gain incentive. And we also have primary and secondary needs. So primary um, needs reflect the struggles to survive. So the things that we, we have to eat, that we, we need to, to actually survive. Um, and then these are acquired needs or displacements of primary needs. Um, so sometimes we can associate something with a primary need <clears throat> to to make it happen. So let's say like these, like in advertisements are a great example of this, right? So we have a primary need um, to reproduce, right? And so in advertisements, we might, um, we might associate the thing that we want people to buy with that primary need of reproduction to, um, to convince people that they should also um, have a drive for the secondary thing that we're selling, right? So, um, Here's another example. Um, if I'm playing catch with my dad, um, it, playing sports becomes associated with this positive feeling of love and belonging, which is a primary need, love and belonging. So I now have a desire to play catch, even though playing catch, um, playing sports is not a primary need, right? Um, buy, buying a hamburger is not necessarily a primary need, but, but now I have this um, association with um, um, this burger, right? So um, that's another, that's how drive theory works. Um, so our drives um, can be prim both primary or secondary needs are triggered. Um, this need becomes internalized and this internalization of the drive is what sets um, drive theorists apart from um, strict behaviorists is that this is something that's an internal process. Um, and the drives um, have three areas, um, three, three components. There's the direction or the focus, right? So for Cookie Monster, that direction is the cookie, right? The goal, right? What I want. There's the intensity, the urgency, right? And Cookie Monster has a strong urgency for this cookie. And then there's the persistence, the varying of staying power. So Cookie Monster always wants cookies. He's unstoppable in his pursuit of cookies, right? Um, but for most people, right? <clears throat> Um, we have a drive for one thing, but the, that that ebbs and flows depending on our mood during the day, depending on what other drives we might have competing for it. So the persistence of that drive is another another factor, right? Or how intensely we feel it over time. So human needs lead to human behavior. The motivation sequence this this is what's proposed to account for all human behavior. So drive theorists would propose that all human behavior is fundamentally um, caused by some sort of human need. So we have some sort of need that leads to a drive. And remember, that could be a secondary drive. That could be a secondary um, need. So remember, playing catch or, or you know, if I, if I um, join an adult baseball league, it might not be because um, I have a primary need for love and belonging, but it might be that I became associated with need, love and belonging for my dad when I was younger. And that drive has both intensity and persistence um, and a direction that leads towards some sort of goal that leads to a human behavior. Um, so this, this um, is the basic outline of what drive theory would look like. And um, on your check for understanding this week, I'm going to ask you to think about how this theory could explain some sort of human behavior that you've experienced. Um, what, what, need, what human need would explain a human behavior that you've had? Okay. Um, so in the classroom, how does this affect what, you as a teacher? So um, you can think about how primary needs need to be met before academic needs. So that if a child is concerned about their food, they're hungry, um, security, physical comfort, that that's going to motivate their behaviors. So they might be acting out, um, they might be misbehaving, and that might not be that might be because they are fulfilling some sort of basic human need for attention or for love and belonging um, that might be unrelated to their interest in your class or what they want to learn, but because they have to fulfill these other basic primary needs first. 
um, that you have to understand the individual needs of a student before you can um, before you can motivate them to learn, that you have to know that every student might have different drives and different needs. Um, and that we could build associations between primary and secondary needs. So for example, we know that a primary human need is love and belonging. So if we can associate your classroom and your learning with a place where students feel like they are a part of a community, then they're going to associate being in your classroom with something positive and then they'll be more willing to be motivated to, to participate and to be a part of that learning experience. Okay, so that's, um, so drive theory is a pretty basic um, explanation of human behavior and it falls really in line with that behaviorist thinking, right? Um, just like if we go back to the beginning of the semester. Now let's talk about a humanist view of motivation. And we haven't talked a lot about humanist um, psychology yet in this classroom. So we'll do a quick view of, um, of humanism first. We'll talk about three different theories here. We'll have Maslow, which you've probably heard of before, um, Herzberg, and then self-determination theory under humanist theories. So humanist, humanistic psychology really um, followed behaviorism and was really a, um, a an argument against behaviorism it was really um, a, a pendulum swing, swing against behaviorism. So there was a reaction to. Um, it believed that human beings superseded the sum of their parts. So they couldn't be just components, but that, that the holistic view of a human um, was greater than the sum of its parts. That um, we have our existence in a uniquely human context so that things that we studied with animals might not really translate to to what it means to be a human being um so so a lot of the work that you know skinner and pavlov did with animals does it does that really make sense in a human context we're much more complex than uh, pigeons right um that we're aware and we're aware of being aware we're conscious and that consciousness plays a part in our psychology and that we um, are aware of ourselves in context of other people and that that relationship those social aspects are important as well um, that we have the ability to make choices and we have responsibility for those choices um, we are intentional about our aims and goals that we're not just purely um, making choices based upon um, rewards and punishments but that we are um, we're aware of future events where we're, we're making complex decisions we're not just thinking about um, our basic human drives perhaps and we have also meaning value creativity critical thinking all of those things that um, that our advanced brains let us do um, play a part in our psychology it's really what the humanists are thinking about right so this is really, um, the first one we'll talk about is Maslow, and this is a picture of Maslow. He lived until 1970, um, and he was really one of the big founders of humanistic psychology. So if you say humanistic psychology, um, one of the first things people are going to think of is Maslow. So, um, and you've probably um, seen his self-actualization pyramid before, is this idea that we have basic human needs that need to be met before you can move up the pyramid um, to meet other needs. Um, and reaching self-actualization, I always feel like this feels like a, like a really hippie concept. And I'm, and I'm as, especially as an undergrad, when people present this to me, I was never really sure what self-actualization meant. Um, but really what it means is that we have this ability to trust others, to be creative, to problem solve, to have a sense of morality. Um, so it's not like this really lofty goal that only a few reach. Um, it's really something that that's attainable for all and that we should really be striving for for um, our students to, uh, to reach as well in order for us to have optimal learning characteristics in our classroom. So um, this is Maslow's um, pyramid um, theory of motivation. And the idea is we start that with that physiological step and we get to self-actualization. So let's talk about each step individually. So our first need are our physiological needs. These are our needs for survival. This really does fit with drive theory here. It's our basic needs such as food, water, sleep. Um, when we say homeostasis, that just means that everything is, is in balance. And um, I think sometimes, um, this is really basic, but as teachers, we sometimes forget that the students in our classroom are human beings. And we need to do things like um, let them go to the bathroom when they have to pee. And sometimes this becomes a matter of classroom management, 
But think about it. If you really have to pee, are you learning anything? No, you're thinking about how much you really have to pee. So, so it only makes sense, right, to allow students to fulfill their basic needs. Right. Um, sleep is another one that, you know, students lack. And we think about um, how we set up our class schedules and, and high schools and do all county start so early in the morning that are we possibly letting our kids get enough sleep in order to meet their basic physiological needs when we know about the adolescent brain. Right. Um, but after, let's say they've met their physiological needs, we've allowed them food and water and and we've allowed them to go to the bathroom and they can all have air to breathe, right? Um, hopefully you're not depriving them of air in your classroom, right? So the next one is safety. Do they feel secure? Um, and this is of body. So do they feel like they are, um, are they safe physically in your school? And, and that kind of leads to bullying, right? But there's also employment and resources. And we can't do a lot in our schools to, to help with that if a family situation is unstable, if they're experiencing a crisis at home financially, but um, we can be sensitive to that. Um, we also know that there's things like um, <clears throat> health and property. So do they feel like um, they, um, that they have a place to go home to? Do they feel like they um, are well taken care of? And although we cannot necessarily take care of those things that outside of school, we can make our classrooms and our schools feel like a place that is safe and secure for them, right? Um, and we can also think about the way that children who are homeless or children who are facing food insecurity or um, housing insecurity um, might not be able to learn optimally in our classrooms. Um, then love and belonging, feel friendship, family, sexual intimacy, um, and this is another area where bullying can come in if a child's, um, especially if you think about an adolescent, experiencing um, uncertainty in their friendships um, and, and being excluded from, um, from a friend group or from a clique, then um, they're going to be thinking about that perhaps more than the learning that's happening in your classroom. Um, we can think about the ups and downs of teenage romance and how that can really play a role in how much kids learn in school. And while we can't prevent students from um, exploring those areas of their lives in school, um, we can think about the ways in which this might be preventing them from us belonging environments. Um, and also creating a place that's safe in our classrooms where they know that they have a place in community and they have a place to feel like they belong. And then esteem, they have to know that they respect themselves and that they are respected by others. So building that self-esteem aspect, and we've talked about this with social cognitive theory as well, that I will not be motivated to do something unless I feel like I can achieve it, that I have confidence in myself. So another aspect of this motivation theory is feeling confidence within myself and respected by others so that I can do things, that I can take chances. And this is all about that classroom environment that you build. And then finally, when I have all of these things below me, then I can build a classroom and I can, I can take those chances. I can reach those highest levels of learning um, that I can problem solve. I can be creative. I have morality. I can accept facts. I can um, work without prejudice, right? All of these things. Um, so how do I do this in a classroom? And we really think about these classroom implications. Um, so some critiques. Um, the first one is that it lacks some scientific rigor, that um, this holistic approach didn't really control for variables. He, he worked on this um, with looking at a bunch of basically teenage white boys who were very similar in ideologies. There's some cultural bias there as well. And he didn't really control for other variables. So I think that intuitively, this model makes a lot of sense to people, but I want you to keep in mind that it hasn't been rigorously studied and there's not really a good way to study this theory. Um, and it really focuses on the subjective experiences. So it does a little to explain society um, impacts on personality development. And um, I also think that, um, that 
we also have some maybe some anecdotal evidence and maybe some scientific evidence that shows that you don't really necessarily have to have the first level filled before you can go to the next one, right? We have plenty of, of anecdotal evidence of students who have been able to overcome poverty, have been able, over, able to overcome really difficult situations and reach self-actualization um, despite these challenges in their lives. So I also wouldn't want a teacher to use Maslow's theory to think, oh, a child who's ho experiencing homelessness or a child who's experiencing violence in the home can't learn. Um, because certainly we know they can, um, but I do think it's important um, on the flip side to think about how these challenges might um, make challenges to learning and how we as a classroom might be able to help meet some of those needs. Let's look at Herzberg, another um, powerhouse in um, humanistic psychology. Um, and here's a picture of Herzberg. Um, he lived to 2000. And he's really thinking about the business world. So a lot of psychology is, is focused in, in the corporate, um, corporate world. And he's looking at the motivator hygiene theory, um, which is also called the two factor theory. So there's motivating factors and hygiene factors, which I think hygiene is a weird word here, but let's take a little bit of a closer look. So these motivation factors are things that increase satisfaction. These are motivators. And if we think in the workplace, um, these are the things like that get people to work harder. So if they have achievement that they can gain or recognition or the work itself is motivating, like um, being a professor is motivating because I get to work with students and experience your learning, right? Um, I have responsibility for the things that I do, and that gives me a sense of achievement. Um, I have the opportunity to be promoted or to grow professionally. These are all things that increase my satisfaction with my job, um, and they motivate me to work harder, right? Um, and then we have um, hygiene factors, which is a little bit weird, right? But what it means is these decrease my dissatisfaction. So hygiene factors are things that make me less likely to experience dissatisfaction. So pay and benefits. Um, if I get paid, then I'm less likely to be homeless. I'm less likely to be hungry, right? I can fill the needs that would cause me to have dissatisfaction. Um, company policies, um, relationships with coworkers, supervision. Um, my status, having job security, not getting fired, right? My working conditions and my personal life. These are things that um, are, are likely to make me dissatisfied. And if I, as a working, as a boss or as a teacher, perhaps of students, if I can work with these things, I'm less likely to have students that are dissatisfied with my classroom. Um, so it's, they're not necessarily motivating me to do more, but they're less likely to make me dissatisfied. Um, which is an important component of being in a workplace. So again, thinking about how as a teacher, I could increase those motivators and increase the ways in which I am decreasing their dissatisfaction. That was a lot of increases and decreases, but you understand, right? And again, this is really coming from the corporate world. And I think you probably, any of you who've had a job, um, can probably think about the ways in which this might have impacted you as an employee. And then finally, the self-determination theory with um, Desi and Ryan. And I think this is probably um, the most complex of the humanist theories and the one that really is tying in a lot of different ideas and the most modern of the theories with maybe the most research support. And I like self-determination theory a lot, really. It's based upon the idea of intrinsic motivation. So um, it gives what gives a person satisfaction without a reward? So without some sort of pay or candy or um, what motivates someone to do something because of something internal? The activity itself is that reward. And that's really different than the behaviorist drive theory approaches, right? Um, so it has um, five different components that lead to intrinsic motivation, enjoyment, inherent satisfaction, autonomy, interest, and competence. And let's talk about each one separately. So the first one is enjoyment. Do you enjoy the task itself? Is it something that brings you pleasure? Um, inherent satisfaction. Do I get satisfaction from the task? Does the task connect me to others, perhaps? What, what um, brings me satisfaction? So I might not enjoy doing laundry, but I get um, 
I get satisfaction from doing it because it, it's, you know, when I'm done with it, it feels good to be done. Or um, it makes me, when I fold my children's clothes, it makes me feel close to them perhaps, right? Um, autonomy. Do I feel like I have choice or it's um, when I'm doing this where I feel controlled? If I feel controlled, I'm going to be less, I'm going to have less intrinsic motivation. But if I have choice, in how I complete the task, if I get to have responsibility for that task, if I get to work as a, in an autonomous way, I'm going to be more motivated. And this is a critical piece to, um, to classrooms. I think as teachers, we often feel like we have to control what's happening in the classroom in order to maintain maybe classroom management, but that um, automatically decreases the motivation children have. So the more autonomy we can give children, even young children, the more motivation they will have for the tasks. Interest. So is the person interested in the task? Is it something that we find, um, does it spark our curiosity? Is it something that we can build? And one way to build interest for students is to be interested in yourself, to show your own curiosity, to show your own enthusiasm for it, because that can be contagious. Um, and finally, competence. Do I feel competent to complete the task? And again, that leads, that connects to self-efficacy. I'm going to have more intrinsic motivation when I know that I can be successful at the end of this, right? So, um, Thinking about, as a teacher, how you could influence each of those pieces of the, um, of the pie can really help us to motivate students. And I really think that autonomy piece and that self-determination, um, which kind of leads to the name self-determination, is key and critical to class. That when we give kids choices, when we say, even as simple as, here are two worksheets, you can choose one of them to do tonight. Or um, you can pick 10 of these 20 questions to answer. Um, or here's a choice board, pick one, pick five activities. Um, or you can sit in your desk or on the floor to do your silent reading today. That choice empowers kids and motivates them. And I know that you as college students also appreciate choice um, in your lives. So thinking about, again, um, our students are little people or big people, and we should give them choices and autonomy in the work that they do, and that will help them be more motivated to complete your coursework. So now we'll look at cognitive views of motivation. So thinking about the brain, right? And in this one, um, we're really thinking about um, expectancy value theory here, um, at, which is linked to attribution theory. Um, and expectant, so what are the, why cognitive views? So motivation is um, influenced by our cognition, our brain, the way that we think, right? Um, and that cognition also leads to our motivation, so it's a reciprocal relationship here. There were, that um, cognition and, and how we're thinking about things um, um, is a, both the cause and an effect of our motivation. And so, um, we have attributional theory and expectancy value. So attributions are, um, with Weiner, um, interpretations of our past determine our future behavior. Um, so we have causal properties. Um, so, um, so whether we believe that it is stable or unstable, so our expectancy. So do we think that things will happen the same way that they happened before again? How, how much do we, uh, do we think that that is, is likely to happen again? Um, our value, which is um, our locus of control, um, our um, whether it's internal or external, um, and so this is something that that is internal to us or external, and our controllability. Who controls this? Is it or is it controllable or not? So um, if it's is it something that someone can control or is it something that someone cannot control? And this is, let's look at a chart here. Um, and the determinants are like ability, effort, task difficulty, luck, right? So let's look at some examples. So um, for example, um, if something is very stable and um, internally controlled, um, that means that like um, if I study for a test, um, I will do better on that test. If I have strong stability, I can control how well I do on that test because, and I, I can control it internally, right? Um, on the other hand, um, if, um, if I think that it is, it's very controllable, but it's not my control, 
it's an external control, then that would be like the teacher controls it. It's, I, I can study, but really how well I do on the test is really determined by the teacher and how hard she makes that test. That's task difficulty, right? Um, if, um, yeah, if it's really unstable, it's about how much effort I put into it. If it's really stable, then it's how much ability I have. So it doesn't really matter how much I study or not study. It's about my own internal ability. If I, if it's about how much effort, if it's very unstable, then that could be, I could put in a lot of effort and do well, or I could put in a little bit of effort and not do well. Um, or it could be that it's external and it's really unstable. It's really just a matter of luck. No one's controlling um, how, how hard or difficult the test is. It's just a matter of luck if I do well or not, if I guess well. So you can see how all of these things interact with each other in attributional theory. Um, and then, so, um, and that's really locus of control. And then we kind of expand on that a little bit more with expectancy value theory with Eccles and Whitfield, which this is our most complicated model of motivation. Um, and our future is determined by expectancy, how well we expect to do, and our task value. So how much we value that task, which um, is our attainment value, how important we think it is, how, um, how our utility value, so how much how useful we think it is and then our cost so how much work do we how much is it going to cost us to 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 gain this and for to gain this this task or to do this task um so this is the whole expectancy value model and you can see there's lots of nuance to this there's lots of, of arrows going in lots of different places and we could go through and really analyze this um, but I, I'm not going to make you memorize this whole model because this looks a little overwhelming and certainly if you're taking a graduate course in motivation we would learn all of this um, but instead I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit simpler model here um, because I do think it's important to look at this cognitive processes. So we have um, social influences to our motivation. So things in our things around us that influence um, how much we might value a task, like um, our friendships, or how much our friends, our peer pressure, our teachers, those kinds of things. And that leads us to some sort of cognitive process about the task. And then we have, then, it, then that's where it gets divided between affective and cognitive processes. So we have, um, Affective memories, um, how, whatever our experience has been with the past, which leads us to how much we value it. Um, so if I have positive memories and I have good feelings about the task or, or if it reminds me of something that might be really negative in my past. Um, and then I have cognitive processes um, where I think about um, my expectancy. Do I think that I will do well in this task? Um, and then both of those things kind of combine together for my observed behaviors. So we can think about how our beliefs and our, our affective memories and our cognitive processes kind of blend together to decide how well I'm going to, um, how motivated I'm going to be to do this behavior. So you could think about how with any task um, we might as a person um, be influenced by both. So how does this motivate us in the classroom? Um, in expectancy value theory, as a teacher, I would want to build those opportunities for students to feel confident and expect to do well. So we have that expectancy piece. And then I also want to build that value. So I want to build in how do students um, value the task? Can I make them know how important or what's the utility of this task? Why would it be important? And then I'm um, thinking about their autonomy to engage in activities that they value. So if they think that something's important, am I giving them the chance to engage in those activities? And then attributions, if we think about that locus of control, I want them to focus on internal attributions. What are the things that they can control? And that I should be consistent and fair in their evaluation so that they can count on me for that to be stable. Um, and I want them to focus not so much on ability being a stable trait, but focus more on that ability as effort and achievement, and that they can they can influence ability as an unstable trait by working hard and getting better, um, which we'll talk more about next in the next module with um, a little bit about growth mindset. So those were all of our um, 
series on motivation. Um, that was a whirlwind tour of motivation. Um, I want you to pay attention to thinking about the differences between um, neo-behaviorist drive theory, humanist theories about the whole, the whole person, um, cognitive theories of motivation, thinking about how our cognition influences this, and um, thinking about how all of these theories are really looking at motivation from different perspectives. Um, so again, email me, contact me if you have questions about the differences between them. My door is always open to talk to students and really motivation is one of my favorite things to think about um, from different perspectives. So I hope you have a great week, guys. Have a good one. Bye.